wasn't in my notes. <laughs> oh, uh, that was totally unexpected. And all I can say is thanks. <laughs> hey, thanks, guys. <laughs> Fantastic, buddy. Well, thank you guys. Uh, it, it's wonderful to be here with you. Um, so I don't think there's a way to transition, so we're just gonna, <laughs> we're, we're, we're just gonna shift without a clutch. Uh, <laughs> so I wanna, I wanna highlight um, a, couple, a couple of important announcements for us as a church family. Uh, the, the first one is, so next Sunday, uh, September 1st, can you believe it? We're gonna be in September. So Labor Day weekend on September 1st at 10 a.m. is our service, but we're not going to be here. We're going to be at the Athletic Fields, 139 Clinton Street, okay? So next week at the Athletic Fields, uh, we're going to have baptisms. We're going to have a cookout after the service and an announcement for parking. We're going to have the gravel lot open and on-street parking, for those of you who have been to the fields before, we're not going to have the grass lot available, so just plan accordingly on that, okay? And that's next Sunday at 10 a.m., and if you, if you accidentally show up here, there's going to be notes on the door, okay? So then we'll see you over at the fields. So that's next week, and then two weeks from now, Sunday, September 8th, is really, really important, one service that day. Sunday, September 8th, one combined 10 a.m. service, because after the service, we're going to have our team and group connect. Uh, you're going to learn about, if, if you come to that, we encourage you to do so. You're going to learn about the primary ways to get connected, get involved here at Center Point Church. There's going to be room for engagement and interaction with our group leaders and our different team volunteers, as well as our forward team. So you're not going to want to miss that. So mark that in your calendars. Next Sunday, 10 a.m. at the fields, two Sundays on the 8th from now, one combined service, 10 a.m. here, followed by the team and group connect after the service. So everybody good? Amen. Okay, all right, and then once we hit the 15th, then we're back to two services. So you're gonna hear more about that in the coming weeks, but 9-1 and 9-8, 10 a.m. Okay, so let me pray for us, uh, and then we're gonna jump in. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be here together as your body at Center Point. Father, we need you. Father, we want you and we welcome you here this morning. We know you are everywhere always by your spirit and we ask that right now you would have all of us, all of ourselves and all of us together. We commit this time to you. Speak to us. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We are sandwiched right between breakfast and lunchtime right now, so I'm going to ask a question that I hope doesn't cause tummies to rumble. But by, and I usually don't say by show of hands, but this one by show of hands. It is my birthday now, I get to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> by show of hands, how many of you enjoy a good meal? Yeah, uh-huh, I got two arms up for that one. That's right, enjoy a good meal. Now, if you are like me, maybe your favorite meal is breakfast, Anybody? Yeah, okay, well, so we got some breakfast lovers in here. Okay. All right, so question, question for the kids. This is all together August. This wraps up our last Sunday all together. Question for kiddos. Just shout out one word, kind of what's your favorite breakfast food? Cereal. Cereal. Sausage, egg, and cheese from McDonald's. Oh, from McDonald's. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic and very specific. I love it. And maybe one more. Steak, eggs, and potatoes. Steak, eggs, and potatoes. Oh, I'm coming to your house for breakfast. <laughs> I'm coming to your house. So, so I want you to think about your favorite meal, and then I want you to think about the possibility of getting that meal plus everything else that your hearts that your hearts desire when it comes to food all in one place. Okay. So, growing up in Pennsylvania, back when I was a teenager. Uh, I hated waking up early. I hated when the alarm went off. The snooze button was my friend. Anybody relate to that? Yeah, okay. Some of us still relate to that, right? Uh, snooze, snooze, snooze. Except once a quarter, when the alarm would go off 
And it was like the angels were singing and heaven had opened. Because my friends and I, once a quarter, would schedule a time to go to the eighth wonder of the world called Shady Maple. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, some of you know about Shady Maple. All right. You're with me. Okay, great. We would get in the car, we would drive 45 minutes, and it would just be, the car would just be giddy with laughter. Giddy with, like, you would never expect teenage boys to wake up early and be laughing this much, but we were because we were on our way to Shady Maple. And we'd park at Shady Maple in this massive lot with all of these other patrons who were ready to get their breakfast on, and we would make our way in through those doors, and immediately upon entrance, all the food would hit your nostrils. Oh, the bacon, the eggs, and you walk in kind of deeper and deeper into this sacred space of the eighth wonder of the world called Shady Maple. And as you're walking into these rooms, you're walking past the pancake station with all the ingredients that you can add, including cereal, to your pancakes. You walk by the sausage. You walk by the sausage wrapped in bacon. You walk by the sausage wrapped in crispy bacon. If that's even possible, but it was. You walk even further into the inner sanctum and you walk past the baked goods section, the homemade cream-filled sprinkles and frosting on top donuts. And you sit down at your table and you hear the clink, 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 clink of the wait staff setting down all of the dishware. Welcome to Shady Maple. What would you like to drink this morning? Oh, an experience. Now, it was an amazing experience, but it was a costly one, especially for a high schooler. <laughs> it was costly. You had, you had to pay for this, but the anticipation and the payoff and the reward and the food coma following this experience was all worth it. So worth it. Food is just as important as the Bible. Sure, there are days of fasting, days of abstaining, but there are days of feasting and days of celebration. And today in our passage, as we wrap up our time in Samuel, we're going to get one last snapshot of King David, who has a royal feast. And he's going to invite someone to his royal feast at his royal table. And instead of great anticipation, we're going to see that this person approaches the table with fear and dread and anxiety only to find love, acceptance, and great food. So turn with me to 2 Samuel. We're gonna be reading chapter nine this morning. For those of you who wanna tune in via your phone, you can do so. Uh, hold that up, scan that QR code, it'll take you right to the passage. So let's jump right in. Chapter 9 of 2 Samuel. David asked. Now this is sometime after Saul had died. Okay, we heard about that last week. So we're flipping ahead several chapters here. David asked, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David and the king said, are you Ziba at your service? He replied, the king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered, there is still the son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he's at the house of Makir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So David had him brought from Lodabar from the house of Makir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, just pause right there and say that with me. Mephibosheth, it's an easy one. Son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David. He bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And you, you, Mephibosheth, will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said, I've given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. 
And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. This is the story that we're invited into today. Now, I've got some questions for us along the way, and I'm going to invite maybe one word or one sentence at most responses. And what I want us to do right now together is we're going to explore this story. So my first question for us as we explore this story is there's, there's kind of three main characters. Who are the three main characters that we see? So just name one. We'll start with one. Okay, so I'm hearing David and Mephibosheth. So let's start with David. So way to go. Round of applause for yourselves. Way to go. You got, you got it right. Two out of three, okay? So let's start with David. David, David in Hebrew, his name means beloved. Beloved. And David is from Bethlehem, which means house of bread. And he's currently here now living in Jerusalem, which means city of shalom. Shalom. Hebrew, in the Hebrew, shalom means peace, a completeness, a wholeness, everything right. Shalom. And then we've got Mephibosheth. There's about 50-50 here, David Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth, it's a hard name to say, but here's what it means in English. It means end of shame. End of shame, Mephibosheth. And he is living in this passage in Lodabar. Now, Lodabar in Hebrew means no place or no thing. Nothing. End of shame from nothing, from no place. And then we've got a third character in this story. And can, can you take a, a run at who he is? Yeah, Ziba, that's right, Ziba, Ziba, that's right. His name means alliance in Hebrew, alliance. And so Ziba is Saul's household servant. Now, these are our three main characters in this story. And as we enter into the story, we've identified these characters, we've identified their names, because names are really important, particularly in biblical times for the Hebrews. But now I want us to shift a bit. What, What repeated word do you notice show up three times in this passage, and it's on the lips of David in verses one, verses three, and verse seven? Verse Verses 1, 3, and 7, there's one word that shows up, and it's always on David's lips here. What? Kindness. Kindness, Kindness, that's right. Kindness. Now, we're going to do this one together because it's just too fun to not do it together. In the Hebrew, this is the word chesed. Chesed. So you clear your throat. Chesed. Chesed. That's right. Okay. So kids are having fun with this. This is good. This is why we're doing this. Chesed. Now, It's a really difficult word to translate into English. And and here's why. Because there's no one word in English that captures the beauty and the fullness of this word chesed. So I want you to envision all of the positive, overwhelmingly good, merciful, loving, and gracious character traits of God who John tells us in 1 John 4 is himself in his very essence love and wrap all of those character traits up into this word, chesed. And that's what this means. It means God's loyal love. God makes promises, and God keeps those promises. You can take a look in your own time, but Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, you can write that down. Take a look at that in your own time. It's this passage where God is talking to Moses and and the Israelites had just broken the commandments and Moses went down from Mount Sinai and shattered the commandments and he went back up and God reaffirms the promise that he made even though the stubborn, stiff-necked people, 
they're wavering in their love for him, in their loyalty to him, and he doubles down on his loyalty to them. And he said, it's, he is full of love and compassion, extending forgiveness and grace to a thousand generations. And this word chesed shows up right there in that passage. It's the most oft quoted, the most oft quoted Old Testament passage throughout scripture. This self-revelation of who God announces himself to be and right in that announcement of who he is is chesed, loving kindness, loyal love. Now the best way to see this word and understand it is to actually watch this word play out in action, in real time. See, because this is important. Love is like a diamond and it has many facets And this is really, really important because I can say, you hear me say, oh, I I love my wife. And you're like, yeah, cool. And then you'll hear me say, I love the Philadelphia Eagles. And you boo me. You can boo me. It powers me up. Okay, it powers me up, people. Boo me. I want you to boo me. No one's booing me. Hey, okay, there it is. Okay. You'll hear, (laughs) you'll, you'll hear me say, I love Shady Maple. You'll hear me say, I love whiteboards. Okay. Am I experiencing the same inner desires when I talk about all of those things? Absolutely not. That would be ridiculous to think that I love a whiteboard like I love my wife. That's ridiculous. So in the Bible, both in the Old and New Testaments, there are multiple words that get translated into English as love. Okay? So I want you to think about love is like a diamond. So we've got the physiological effects, the affections of the heart, the stirrings, but there's also a commitment and an act of the will. And that's what we're gonna focus in today in this passage because David is going to show us what chesed looks like right here in this passage. So my next question to you is, how does David show kindness, there's our word, how does he show kindness to Saul's family? How do we see him displaying this in real time and space? How does he show love? In other words, it's not just like David's like, I wanna show, I wanna do nice things. I'm having nice thoughts about Saul's family. No, he's like, I'm going to take action, people. I wanna display this love. What do we see him do here for Saul's family? Go ahead. Gives them farmland. That is super, super important. So let's camp out on that one for a second. Uh, let's see, if you want to shout it out, what verse, what verse did you see that in? I think it's 10. 10, great, fantastic. So in verse 10, so, so David is giving Mephibosheth Saul's land. Here, here's why this is important. All of Saul's relatives either died or ran away. Okay, so in ancient Israel, when land was left go, it was, and nobody was there to buy it, it would actually just go right to the king, and he would own it. Now, here's the very interesting thing. In Torah, that's teaching or instruction, what we call law, usually you'll see that translated as law with capital L in your Bible. In Torah, every 50 years in ancient Israel, okay, so this is ancient Bible times, every 50 years, all of the people's land would get reset and given back to its original land owner, the family, Okay, and this is really, really important because sometimes hard times happen and families had to sell their land in order to survive and then they would become servants on other people's lands. It it might be hard for us to conceptualize that because we live in the day and age in which we do, but this was an agrarian society. Like they lived off of the land. Land was life. And every 50 years there was to be a reset. This is called the year of Jubilee, Okay, here's the sad part. There's not one example in the whole Bible, in the Old Testament, there's not one example of the Israelites actually practicing Jubilee. There's not one. In fact, the prophets will rail on this. They will say, you become just like the other nations taking advantage of the weak and the people on the margins right here when you're supposed to be a city on the hill and a light to the nations. So not one example. And so what David is doing here is astounding. He is actually enacting a micro jubilee to Mephibosheth and Saul's family. Saul, who we've seen this whole sermon series, who's the one who tried to kill him. See, this is the upside down kingdom. Enemies are turned friends. Sometimes turned family And this is what we see David doing here. And this is so important because Mephibosheth was living off of someone else's land 
in servitude to them. And so David redeems that land. He buys it back and then he gives it back to him and restores it. So this is an act of provision, not just for Mephibosheth and Micah, his son, but for their family lineage for generations to come. So great observation. How else does David show kindness to Saul's family? Yeah, that's right. Thank you, thank you both. So he has him eat at his table. He has him eat at his table. And this is so amazing. At, at the end of verse 11, it says, so Mephibosheth ate at God's, or at God's, at David's table like one of the king's sons. What did Mephibosheth have to offer David? Nothing. Low to bar. <laughs> nothing. He could, he, nothing. In fact, the passage tells us two times over, actually more than twice, that he was lame in both feet. He has this disability. He, he can't tend to things like other people could. This, this is why when he shows up and, and David has to tell him, don't be afraid. It says that Mephibosheth shows up before David and, and he lies prostrate. He bows down before him. Can you imagine how painful this would have been for him? Like he's walking into the scene thinking, surely David's called me there to kill me. Surely he's called me, because what do I have to offer him? What do I have to give him? You know what I have to give him? I'm from Saul's line. <laughs> the guy who tried to kill him. I don't have anything to offer him. Mephibosheth will say later in 2 Samuel, David, what, what did any of my family members, including me, deserve? We deserve death. We deserve death. And what have you shown me? Chesed, loving kindness. Treating him as his very own son. So can you, can you imagine this scene? Like Mephibosheth is now sitting at the king's table. Like, he gets shady maple every day free of charge. <laughs> like he's getting the crispy wrapped bacon sausage every day free of charge. So let's, let's use our sanctified imaginations for this next question, okay? A word or a sentence at most. How might have the table changed Mephibosheth how did eating at King David's table change Mephibosheth? What do you think? A sense of oh, yes, a sense of belonging. Here is Mephibosheth from no thing or no place. Here's Mephibosheth, one of the few remaining people from Saul's line. Think about the PR around Saul's line. <laughs> Probably really bad. Probably not a, pe a, lot of, a lot of people caring. Probably people in his own tribe of Benjamin even being like, I, I don't want to get near that. That guy's bad news. And yet here is David in the upside down way. Like this is why God says, David is a man after my own heart. I want you to bless those who persecute you. I want you to pray for those who are your enemies. And David says, that's not enough. I want to invite them in and I want them to sit down and dine at my table and be like one of my own. What a sense of belonging. Awesome observation. How else might the table change Mephibosheth? Yep, so, so he's, com he's coming with this disability, right? Yep. He's coming with this, surely he's being cared for, right? Because David's a man after God's own heart. What do we see in God's heart? Even in the Old Testament, right? Like we can have this conception, God of the Old Testament's really angry, capricious, he's easily ticked off. But then there's Jesus and he's, he gives me the fuzzies. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like father, like son, like son, like father. God's heart is for those on the margins. God's heart is for the least of these. God's heart are the ones that society builds its backs on. God says, no, 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 care for them. So great observation, Norman. This is what David's doing. He's reflecting God's heart right here in this passage. Okay, so Karen, you had something. That's right. 
particularly in that day and age. So for those of you who might not have heard Karen, she was talking about that it gave him this sense of worth, right? So he's got this disability, and particularly in this day and age, like, there weren't necessarily things that took care of people with dis- disabilities, right? This is why studying our scripture is so important because God's heart is for this and here is David mirroring this. And so this gives Mephibosheth a sense of identity and a sense of value that he probably didn't have. He was from no place or no thing, for goodness sake. Okay? And here he is sitting and dining, not just with the king, but he's being treated as one of the king's family. Like talk about totally having your world shifted upside down and inside out. David says, I see you, I value you, I want you here. Why? Because I understand God's heart and I wanna reflect his heart into the world. And now we've already talked about how David showed kindness to Saul's family through giving him the fields. Now what's interesting about that, so he gives him a sense of identity, a sense of belonging, and now he's gonna give him a sense of security and provision. And I kid you not, I'm not making this up, I didn't know what Todd was gonna be talking about this morning. I didn't know that we were gonna sing a song this morning that talked about sitting at the king's table. I didn't, I didn't, they didn't know what I was gonna be preaching, I just decided that this week. And this is how God works, is he ties these themes together because he's speaking to our hearts and our minds. He's speaking to us as his people and he's reminding us, look at this story. Look at how I actually lived into Mephibosheth's name and I brought an end to his shame. I gave him a new identity. I gave him a new family and sense of belonging and I gave him provision and sustenance and nourishment beyond anything that he could have comprehended. Friends, this is chesed. This is is over the top abundant generosity from our good God. And this is how he views us, you, me. Now there's this great quote uh, from a gentleman named Leonard Sweet. Um, If we could bring that up, thank you, thank you. Um, So I've actually had the privilege of sitting under uh, Len, he was one of our kind of like guest professors where I went to seminary. Uh, And so this is from one of his books called From Tablet to Table. He says, there's one thing that would dramatically change the world we live in and help return us to our rootedness in Christ. Bring back the table. If we were to make the table the most sacred object of furniture in every home, church, and community, our faith would quickly regain its power and our world would quickly become a better place. The table is the place where identity is born, the place where the story of our lives is retold, reminded, and relived. Such a good quote. And so hard to practice as a modern day Westerner in such a busy, fast paced world. But friends, this is part of our invitation today. Part of our invitation for you and for me and for us as a church is to come and sit at the table. Come and sit at the table. Not David's table, right? David's not here. (laughs) David's in heaven. And there were cracks in David's armor like we saw last week. And as you continue through 2 Samuel, there's gonna be major cracks that turn into caverns in David's armor. And yet God sees him and said, he's a man after my own heart. But did you know what? If you look on your own time in 2 Samuel chapter seven, God made a promise to David. He said, David, it's gonna be through your line, through your ancestors, through your heritage, that I'm gonna raise up an offspring who will be an everlasting king, who will have a kingdom that will welcome people from all nations, tribes, and tongues. And we meet him when we turn to the New Testament and his name is Jesus of Nazareth from the line of David. Not just a mere man after God's own heart, but God's very own heart become man. Jesus, the one who dined with those on the margins. The one who upheld those who were being crushed under the foot, not only of the Roman Empire, but of the religious leaders within the Jewish nation 
itself. The one who cast out demons, the one who healed the lame, the one who would be the snake crushing king, the one who stood up in the synagogue and read from the scroll of Isaiah, quoting about the year of Jubilee, saying, I have fulfilled it today. I am here to usher in redemption. I am here to buy you back. I am here to make you new. I am here to restore all of you and all of creation. I am here to bring in and inaugurate and usher in the very kingdom of God, heaven itself coming right here to earth in this moment, starting now with me. Jesus, the one who finds you, the one who finds me, Mephibosheth, and he puts an end to our shame. He finds us in our places of low debar, no place and no thing. He's found you if you know him. He has tracked you down out of relentless love, out of relentless pursuit, out of chesed, loving kindness, pursuing you and bringing you in to his family, sitting you at his table, giving you a new identity. And what did you and I have to offer him? Nothing. It is an overwhelming love that pursues us. It is unconditioned. There is no thing that you or I can do to earn the favor of the king of all things. It is out of who he is, God's heart become man, that Jesus says, come. He says, come right now and have a seat at my table. Right now and dine with me daily. Right now with the new kingdom family. And one day, he says, there will be a final banquet and feast to end all banquets and feasts when we dine with all those who've trusted in Jesus throughout the ages. He says people from all nations, from east and west, from north and south, all of them, tribe, tongue, and nation, will come into my family. Why? Because I've crushed the head of the snake. I have defeated and disarmed the powers that have held humanity in captivity. I have made a way for new life to start now. And friends, this is the invitation for us. So there's some of us here today, we don't know Jesus. What's the invitation today? Come, sit at the table. Receive rescue. Receive salvation. Receive the forgiveness of your sins and the debts owed to the Lord and to others. Receive. Why? Because he's good. He's kind. He's merciful. He's loving. And he wants to make you new. For others of us, we know him. What's the invitation for us? Come, sit, eat, we come in this morning carrying burdens. We are weighed down. We are overwhelmed. We don't know where to turn. We're trying harder, but it's not enough. And the invitation that Jesus has for us reminds me of his words in Matthew chapter 11 where he says this. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I want to invite us to take maybe one or two minutes, and we're just going to pray. We're going to pray, and it's going to be quiet. We'll, we'll hear ambient noises, of course, but it's going to be quiet as we can because we don't get these opportunities unless we carve out this space, okay? And all we're gonna do, you, you get to do what you want, but I'm gonna invite you, you can put your hands right, right on your legs, just in a posture of openness. 
I want to receive, Lord. I want to receive and be reminded of the love that you always have for me. But I need that right now. So let's settle into our chairs. And just for the next minute, you're not going to hear from me. That's my birthday gift to you. And we're just going to sit. We're just going to sit and invite the Spirit of God to come that we might receive his love that is always here. Father, as David writes in Psalm 139, would you search us, show us, remind us of your great love for us. We thank you that we're always invited to your table. Help us to be intentional about taking a seat. We need you. Thank you for ending our shame. Thank you for rescuing us out of no place. And give us a fresh perspective of your love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our invitation is to come and sit at the table. One final invitation for us then is to go and set the table. There's a slide with a pendulum on it. I'm gonna show you. Um, If we can bring that pendulum one up, thank you. We receive abundantly from him. Every day we receive abundantly from him so that we might go and we might share extravagantly with the world so desperate and in need the water of life to a desert, arid wasteland. And the invitation is for us individually, for us as a church to be a little Eden wherever we go. To be Jesus' hands and feet wherever we go. To display love in action. To lean in in a day and age that is drowning in noise. to display love in simple ways, like sitting at a table, sitting at a desk, sitting in a classroom, sitting on your front porch, in a world that doesn't know what it is to listen and to lean in and see the person across from you and listen in love and curiosity with questions. What is God doing in their lives and they might not even be aware of it? And there's a cost to this. This is costly. On your own time, you can read the next chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 10. David goes to show chesed to a king's family who had passed away and to to say that it turned into a food fight would be to put it mildly. It got really ugly. This costs us something but we can do it because it cost him everything and he's made a way for us to be at his table. We started with a jubilant story at Shady Maple and we'll end with a tender story right in my own front yard. A few months ago, one of my neighbors, I was outside with my boys, they were doing their thing. (laughs) running around and playing up and down the driveway and on the sidewalk and he pulls into his driveway and he gets out of his car and he marches right over towards me. 
It was unexpected. And he said, Joe, I need to talk to you. Like, I need to talk to you right now. Oh, okay, and just on him, you could see heaviness, sadness, weighing on him. And in my mind, I thought, well, okay, let's see. Dinner is ready in 30 minutes, and these kids are crazy. They're going to interrupt us. <laughs> like, what am I to do? And this was a moment that felt like it was ripe with the kingdom breaking in. And so I grabbed two chairs, put them on the front yard, <laughs> told my kids, if you've got questions, let us know what my neighbor and I are going to be talking right now. Of course, we were interrupted, as expected. But they're awesome. Like, they get to see these things happen, right? Like, we get to model this for our kids. We get to model this for one another. And so he sits down next to me, and I just, all I ask is one question. What's up? And he proceeds to tell me how he had just come from a funeral service for his best friend's parents, who both passed away together in an auto accident. And he, he described how they were like a second set of parents to him. And he described with memory after memory the fondness and the affection that he had for them and that they had for him and for their son's friends. And he just kept talking. And you know what? He needed in that moment to just keep talking. He needed in that moment someone to just listen. Now, I, I can't always be that person for him, and he knows that. He can't be that person for me, right? But these moments that are inconvenient, that are spontaneous, where the kingdom breaks in, may we have eyes to see them. And I wish I could tell you, we ended that conversation with him going, I'm coming to Jesus. <laughs> That's not how it ended. It doesn't have to end that way. Because the kingdom is breaking in around us all the time. And the invitation is to set the table. Set the table wherever you are, in your classroom, in your office space, in your neighborhood, with your own family. Set the table. And you know, I didn't say a whole lot in that conversation. I waited until the end, and all I said was, buddy, your, your love for these people is such a good reminder for me of how God has this love for us as people. And your love for them is a reflection of his love for you. And I could see, because him and I've talked, he, know, he knows, he knows I'm a pastor, which is always awkward when you tell your neighbors you're a pastor. He knows, he knows I follow Jesus. He's let me pray for him before. He's a self-avowed non-Jesus follower. But you know where he keeps coming? He keeps leaning in. He keeps leaning in. He keeps leaning in. And do you, do you know what's required of me? In appropriate ways, with appropriate boundaries, say, come, sit down. What you got going on? You can do this. If I can do this, you can do this. We can do this. We are doing this. And may God continue to increase the fold for our good and for his glory. Because he is good. So as we go from this place, may we remember to carve out intentional times to sit at the table and receive. And may we remember to carve out intentional times to show hospitality to others, but also to be aware of the spontaneous moments where we get to set the table and partner with him in the good work that he is doing all around us, in us, and through us. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for you and we thank you for your loving kindness that you showed to us through your son Jesus and that you live in us through your Holy Spirit. God, you are so good. Help us by your Holy Spirit to be strengthened and empowered to step into places with listening ears, curious minds, and loving hearts that we might join you in the work that you are doing all around us for your glory. Amen. Amen. Friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you this week that he might make his face shine upon others through you as you go. God bless.